So you ever have one of those days where you're trying to get something done and you're on track to do something and suddenly then you end up in front of a camera with a weird graphic t-shirt and your actual glasses you're supposed to wear as a prescription left at home and so you just got your sunglasses and then you've got a dog in your lap and you go, how could my day have gone so different from how I intended it to? Maybe you have had something like that happen to you where you're on track, you wanna get something done, you're called to something, and then you end up in a circumstance that you didn't imagine, right? Well, first off, this dog is cute, right? But that's how my day got sidetracked. I ran over to the other side of town, picked up this dog, it's a shelter dog that came available for adoption, get it for my daughter. It doesn't even have a name yet. It's just dog at this point. But how many things does God call us to that as we've been talking about over the last four weeks that he wants us to do, that he wants us to be involved with, and he let ourselves get off track? Let's listen to Pastor Heath as we talk about exactly that. Welcome to church and a dog. Franz Anton Mesmer was a German physician in the late 1700s who proposed the concept of animal magnetism. Now, it's not what you think. It's He thought an invisible magnetic fluid ran through every single animated being on the planet. He believed that the magnetic gravitational pull of the moon affected the tides and also affected the human body. So, Franz would create false tidal experiences with his patients to cure a myriad of sicknesses and disease and use sounds as a way to loosen and free the body and connect these elements to the individual. Now, there was a newly created instrument called the glass harmonica. It's credited to an American inventor, the famous Benjamin Franklin. Sound familiar? Well, this was key in creating soothing sounds and with a flashy, innovative quality that spellbound the listener with its uniqueness. Let's listen to a clip of it. Nothing had sounded like this before. No one per had performed this type of procedure before. And many claimed to be healed by this innovative treatment. And it was great, except for one issue. It didn't work. It, it simply wasn't true. You see, the treatment did not accomplish the goal. But it was difficult to convince people of this because they were so spellbound by how good they felt because the treatment was encapsulated in so many interesting and good things. Now keep in mind that many physicians in that day were pushing against his innovation and touting the tried and true methods that they practiced. But then again, those were things that included drilling holes in heads, uh, bloodletting, and commonly practicing the use of leeches. So understand, this isn't an innovation versus tried and true thing. It's simply this, all that glitters is not gold and all that's tried and true isn't always true and probably shouldn't be tried. It is a reminder, however, that the methods are always in flux, but the mission never is. But so powerful was Dr. Mesmer's ability to persuade through his medium that today we call the sensation where someone is spellbound by something or focused towards something as being mesmerized. The definition of mesmerized is this, to hold the attention of someone to the exclusion of all else or so as to transfix them. You see, there was nothing inherently bad about the methods that Franz used. They simply didn't accomplish the objective. And for us, it can kind of be the same. You see, most of the time, we don't tend to struggle with being pulled off mission by obviously bad things. When we wake up in the morning, we don't start the day thinking, you know, I'm gonna make a slew of bad choices. I'm gonna derail my life from all of my goals. You see, no one hangs up a poster like that in their room. You see, oftentimes it's the good things that are the most likely to deviate us from our mission. Let's take a quick look at some examples of this in scripture. If you turn to Luke chapter nine, starting in verse 59, Luke is the third gospel in the New Testament. Jesus is talking to the crowds that have been gathered around him and he starts asking people to follow him. And he says to one man this, he said to another man, follow me. But the man replied, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, and hear this, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Still another one said, I'll follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Jesus replied, 
No one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. Now, this doesn't fit the picture of the Jesus we know or the Jesus we tend to hear from. It sounds very harsh, but he's just warming up. If you fast forward in Luke to chapter 14, verse 26, he says this, if anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. See, what Jesus is saying here is he's not, he's not jumping so far as to go, these are all awful things. He's saying, no, anything that competes with my best for you, anything that competes with what I'm calling you to do, whether it be family, whether it be these good things, all of these responsibilities, whatever they are, they pale in comparison to what I'm calling you towards. These good things have actually become distractions in the same way when he talks about, if, if your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. He's not saying go ahead and gouge out your eye, but he's saying anything, anything that pulls you from the mission, even good things, is simply being mesmerized. And see, that's why we're spending time in this series, why Pastor Dan has been unpacking the four heart values that Pure Heart is called to. Because we need to be reminded of why we're called to the things we're called to. What are the things that are uniquely about Pure Heart that we have been asked to do as a community? He unpacked personal connection in week one. Why do we value personal connection? Because we believe that God has called us to provide personal connection for every single person in our community. That's why we invite people to gather together, whether online or in person, but to make sure that everyone has a connection in their life. Authentic community is about making sure that we are being vulnerable with each other. And in doing so, we free each other up into the life that God has created us to live. Tangible impact reminds us that without works, our faith is dead. And so making sure that we are pouring into the community around us is one of the biggest callings that Pure Heart has been called to. And lastly, healthy growth, because we believe that God has called us to grow in body, mind, and spirit. And that's why we lean in the way we do to, to the mental health crisis. That's why we lean in to make sure that we're growing in our spiritual faith. You see, because so many of us won't be distracted by blatant bad things. It's not the bad things that, that will be like very enticing for us. It's often the reasonable, the justified, the good that pull us off mission. That's why there's so much power and focus. And that doesn't mean mission is always 100% action elements. It doesn't mean that we always have to be moving. You see, sometimes the mission is in the waiting. Sometimes it's in the trial that we're going through. But the truth is this, it never deviates from being the mission. And that's why the emphasis on understanding the God-given mission of this ministry exists. Why, why Dan has been spending time driving this home because the mission not only matters, but it's key to unlocking the future God has called us to. And the most likely way for us to be mesmerized is actually by focusing on good things that actually don't push us toward our mission. A great example of this is when Jesus is being tempted by Satan in the wilderness. In Matthew chapter four, starting in verse one, it says this, then Jesus was led by the spirit, and this is after he was baptized by his cousin John, it says, Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. Now, this is interesting. Matthew, who wrote this, has a profound gift of understatement. You see, if I skip lunch, I'm hungry. Going 40 days and nights, Jesus was famished. He wasn't just simply hungry. He was starving. The devil came to him and it says, the tempter came to him and said, hey, if, if you're the son of God, why don't you tell these stones to become bread? Now, how many of you would say that bread is not only a good thing, but actually a great thing? So when I mention Olive Garden, you're automatically tasting breadsticks. If I say Texas Roadhouse, suddenly the rolls are coming to mind and, and the butter, of course. You see, bread is amazing. And for those of you who agree, I see you. You are my people. And in this moment, bread would have been amazing for Jesus. But well, watch this. Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. 
So then Satan's going, okay, got it. So your father's got you covered. He'll keep you safe, he'll keep you nourished. All right, you know what? You should prove that. You should prove that and show everyone that your father's got you covered. It goes on. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. So if you're the son of God, he said, throw yourself down for it is written. You see, Satan's going, okay, you quoted scripture just a minute ago. If we're gonna quote scripture, I can quote scripture. He says this, the quote is, he will command his angels concerning you and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. You see, if this wasn't obviously Satan and it happened to be just some guy talking to Jesus, this could actually be seen as a helpful friend, someone who's an encouragement, someone encouraging him to eat and basically reminding him Philippians 4.13, which hadn't been written yet, you can do all things through you who gives you strength. You see, what was happening here wasn't an obvious bad thing. But Jesus answered him. He said, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Now I'm emphasizing the Lord your God because now we're getting down to it. Satan's going, oh, okay, so if it's about being Lord, if it's about being king, if it's about being in charge, then I've got you covered. I'm your guy. It goes on. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all of the kingdoms of the world and all of their splendor. All of this I will give you, he said, if you'll just bow down and worship me. He's saying, I'll, I'll give you that, this whole place. You can be king and lord of it all. All you gotta do, just give me the nod, a little bow. Acknowledge that I've got the power and we're good. Just say the word, I'll take care of everything. But Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. You see, notice that Satan was trying to get Jesus kind of caught up in the things that he could do how he could show his power, his deity, how he could unlock his vast potential. And if there was anyone who could demonstrate potential, let me tell you what, it was Jesus. You see, we talk a lot about our potential and that can kind of get confusing because within our context, potential isn't about the things that we can do, it's about the things that we're called to. And sometimes we get mesmerized by that potential, the potential of what we could do instead of what we are called to do. I recently heard a friend, uh, Michael Bethany from Gateway Church, say it this way. He said, we never saw Jesus fulfill his potential on earth. We never saw everything that he could do. What we saw is what his father called him to do. You see, Satan's temptations were all about simply trying to get Jesus' focus off of his assignment. And the truth is, Satan does the same thing with us. It is so hard to stay focused. If you've seen Star Wars, then once again, you're my people because that's my love language. It's how I communicate. But in Star Wars, when the TIE fighters are going on their attack run and they're in the trench of the Death Star, the person up front the whole time is going, stay on target, stay on target. And the people behind, they were being attacked by TIE fighters and cannons and everything. They're like, loosen up, they're, 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 their focus is on everything else. And at the very front, the guy's going, stay on target, stay on target. And that's what our life feels like a lot, is that we're trying to stay on target. And yet there's so many distractions around us that are trying to pull us in a million different ways to get us to, as Dan said last week, to get us to blink. And it's so easy to lose our route. A couple of years ago, a few of us were flying into Dallas to head to a meeting. Now our flight got in late and so it was late at night. We picked up our rental and we started towards the place where we were gonna have our meeting. Now, there are certain rules about when you're traveling together in a car that they just happen. This is just how life works. If you're in the driver's seat, you're the only one who can touch the music. Again, that's just canon. I, have, I don't make these rules, but I abide by them. In the same way, whoever is sitting in the passenger seat, they have a responsibility, and that is navigation. Not the one who made the rule, but again, I abide by it. The navigator is supposed to supply the driver with directions so that they can get where they're going. So my friend jumps into the passenger seat to provide that navigation as we try to make our way out of this hectic and crazy airport, knowing which way we're supposed to turn in order to get to where we're going. 
Again, we didn't have a center console or anything, so I'm completely dependent on my friend to give me the right directions. And so as we start on our way, I'm trying to navigate through traffic and going, okay, so when am I supposed to turn? Uh, hang on a second, let me find it. Okay, well, there are turns coming up. Which one should I take? Uh, I, I, I'm not sure. I need you to be sure. Okay, go ahead and turn right. Okay, when? Oh, back there. That's not helpful. All right, let's try it again. We start circling around the airport again. All right, so where is my turn? Where am I supposed to go? Uh, I, I think you're supposed to get in the left lane. Okay, I'm on the right lane. When am I supposed to do that? Like, oh, we, we just passed it. My tolerance and frustration was slowly starting to explode. I'm like, you have one job. All you have to do is navigate us out of here. I'm tired. We're all hungry. We want to get where we're going. And as we continue to drive, we keep missing turn after turn. And finally, I just looked at them and said, where am I supposed to go? And they said, I don't know. Just follow the blue line. There is no blue line on the road. It's only on your phone. You see, without proper direction, we have no idea where we're going and we can lose our route easily. You see, here are three more familiar reasons that we can lose focus. The first one is this, zeal. We get ahead of God and sometimes we think we know better. A good example of this is the crowd that was there after Jesus fed the 5,000. After this tremendous miracle, they were so blown away by it, they tried to make Jesus king by force. Now, why would they do this? Well, you see, in that moment, they saw someone perform a miracle and they had been living for generations with injustice after injustice under the rule of the Roman Empire. They saw Jesus perform a miracle and went, he's our way out. This is the answer to all of our problems. If we just make him king, he will take care, he will bring justice to what we're, he will bring vengeance against our enemies. He will take care of everything. And so they tried to grab onto Jesus to make him king. But in John 6, 15, it says this, when Jesus saw that they were ready to force him to be their king, he slipped away into the hills by himself. Now, why would Jesus do this? Here was a group of people that were excited about putting him into the position of king. You see, Jesus pulled away because it wasn't his mission. The people were passionate. They thought they knew exactly how God needed to deliver them, how this was all gonna work. They saw the potential. They saw what they were owed and they got excited about the possibility and they were going to make it happen. Except for the one simple fact, it wasn't the mission. Your passion is powerful, but sometimes your passion and zeal can simply pull your energy from the best things. And if your passion takes you off mission, then it's a trap. If it's pulling you from the sharper focus, the best question you can ask yourself is this, whose kingdom are you building? The second thing that can tend to derail us is fear. You see, we're scared of failing. In Matthew 25, starting in verse 24, Jesus is telling the parable of the talents. He's talking about three servants who were given bags of silver by their master. Now, the first two had doubled by investing that money, had doubled that money and given it back to their master. The third one had simply buried it. Why? Well, let's find out. It says, then the servant with the one bag of silver came and said, master, I knew you were a harsh man. You, you're harvesting crops you didn't plant and gathering crops you didn't cultivate. I was afraid I would lose your money. So I hid it in the earth. Look, here's your money back. You see, but the mission we're on is not about safety. It's not about avoiding risk. But we can get derailed by the thought that it's better to do nothing than to do something because we fear losing what we have. But here's the truth. None of it's ours to begin with. We're simply stewards. See, all of us are, are afraid of stuff. For, for some, it's failure or uncertainty. And like for me, it, it's clowns, which is completely reasonable. Uh, we've all been there. But here's the deal. Any decision that you make that is made out of fear, even if it's the right decision, is still the wrong decision because it's made with the wrong motive. And because it's made in fear, that decision will always be second-guessed in your mind. 
The third familiar way that we tend to get derailed is through this concept of pain and isolation. See, in those moments, we forget who God is. A good example is John the Baptist. Remember him? He was the one who actually uh, baptized Jesus. He, he saw the heavens part, uh, the Holy Spirit descended on Jesus like a dove. Uh, the voice from heaven said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. This is John the Baptist who actually launched Jesus into his ministry. John the Baptist had seen so many things, so many miraculous things, but then suddenly, because he was at odds with the government, he gets imprisoned and he loses all of it. He loses the following. He's not a part of the mission that's going on anymore. He doesn't get to see the things that are happening. People don't come to visit him as often. He's alone. He's hurting. And in Matthew 11, starting in verse two, it says this. John the Baptist, who was in prison, heard about all the things the Messiah was doing. So he sent his disciples to ask Jesus, are you the Messiah we've been expecting? Or should we keep looking for someone else? This is such a, a hard moment. He's asking, I, I, I'm not sure, are you, are you really it? John, of all people who had seen so much, who had actually pointed everyone and said, this is the Messiah is finding himself going, was I right? It seemed so clear a minute ago, but now I'm not so sure. And I love how Jesus responds. Jesus told them, go back to John and tell him what you've heard and seen. The blind see, the lame walk, those with leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised to life, and the good news is being preached to the poor. See, Jesus didn't scold John. He didn't say, of course, I'm the Messiah. Remember, how, did we, how, have, how long have you known me? We've walked together for so long and you're asking this question? No, he didn't do any of that. He acknowledged the fact that John was questioning and he simply responded by reminding him of what God had been doing, what he was doing then, and what he was gonna continue to do in the future. You see, these deviations or these derailments, they, they may start small or even feel insignificant, but their long-term effects can be enormous. You see, if you draw a straight line from the tip of a ship and it continues going straight for a thousand miles or so, it will end up in the place to which it's pointing. Sounds reasonable. But if that boat moves by only one tiny degree, for a few days of travel, it may seem like that ship is still basically heading to the original target. However, that one degree of change will eventually mean that the ship misses its original destination by over 16 miles on that journey. That simple one degree adjustment may not seem like a big deal, but day after day, as those days slowly add up over weeks, you'll end up arriving at a completely different destination than the one you originally planned. So the question is this, how do we stay on mission and even refocus. So here are three key ways, things that you can do to make sure that you are consistently trying to stay focused and on mission. The first is this, travel with a community that God is moving through. And I encourage you, make sure it's like-minded, it has missional unity and plug into it. What I mean by missional unity is this, there's a difference between missional unity and kingdom unity. See, kingdom unity is every single body of believers around the globe, that's the body of Christ, that's kingdom unity. Missional unity is within that body, there's different parts of the body that have different responsibilities. You see, you might have one community that operates like a hand, you might have another part of the community that operates like a heart. You get messy when the heart starts to try to act like a hand, or the hand tries to start to act like a heart. See, that's missional unity. Joining a community of like-minded believers that have the same mission, the same calling, that same unique element that you do, that you can run with, and that can hold you accountable, that is a great way to make sure that you are staying focused on the mission that God has for you. The second is this, we're gonna dive a little deeper. Discover for yourself what God has called you to. Remember, your potential is not about what you can do, it's about what you are called to do, and more importantly, about the one who called you to it. And thirdly, remember what God has done for you and in you. 
And the truth is this, we're, we're forgetful people. We tend to forget what we're here for. I mean, even beyond that, we, we tend to forget what we're doing from moment to moment in the day. I know that recently, more and more, I have been finding myself walking into the living room and completely forgetting what I went in there for. It's one of those things I got up with purpose, I walked into the living room and them sitting there going, what was I gonna do? Now, I remember my mom saying, well, if you forgot, it must not have been that important. And I know that's not true because I've forgotten my kids' names in the moment, okay? There's times where it, my ADD has gone so many different directions and so many different things that I'm like, oh, there's that, oh, there's that, and then forgotten to go pick them up from school. You see, it's not how important they are. It's just the fact that I'm a forgetful person. I'm a forgetful creature, and all of us are. You see, it's why God had the children of Israel build tabernacles and altars and key monuments. He did this so parents could tell their children what God did for them every time they saw them. It's why he had them do the feasts to remind them. It's why the Lord's Supper exists, why communion exists, so that we can remember what Jesus did on the cross for each and every one of us. It's in that remembrance that we find clarity. I'm reminded of so many different stories of Alzheimer's patients who have slowly deteriorated and their memory has, has all but disappeared. And then in key moments, a song will come up or someone will sit at a piano and start playing something and that music links to a key part of their memory. And suddenly they recall things. They're, they find themselves with these moments of clarity where they look at their loved ones and go, I know you, I remember you. Paul tells us that on this side of heaven, we look through a glass dimly. We struggle with clarity. But we need to be reminded of this. What we do matters. Our focus matters. Our mission matters. But all of it, all of it stems from our connection with God. But even as I say that, I know that there are those of you listening to this, you're simply disconnected. You, you have no point of reference for any of this. And it's simply because you have not yet connected with God. And you're walking through life trying to find purpose. You're trying to find how to unleash your potential. And, and sometimes you're going, why am I here? What is this all about? And you're seeing through a glass darkly. You can't see how the pieces fit and, and that's bringing chaos into, and questions into your life. And all of that is simply because you have not connected with God, a God who has a purpose and a call for your life, who wants you to be in communion with him. So much so that he paved a way so that you could come to him by taking all of the sin, all the shame of everything that you've ever done, all the things that you could do and putting it on him and dying on the cross just so that you could be connected to him. And before we end, I wanna take this moment right now that if you're feeling that, if you've been struggling with finding your purpose, if you've been struggling with going, what am I supposed to do? I keep feeling like I'm just roaming around and lost. God doesn't want you to feel lost. He wants you to know that he has a call on your life, that you have a purpose and he has a plan for you. If you would just invite him, into your life. And so if you're listening to this and you know in your heart right now that this is a step that you wanna take, I wanna encourage you to do this. Close your eyes if you safely can wherever you're at and simply say this prayer in your own words. Say this, God, I'm lost. Most of the time, I don't know the direction I'm supposed to be going and I don't know what I'm tethered to. I don't know what my purpose is, but I know and I feel and I believe that you have a plan for my life and that you've even paved the way for me to be connected to that plan and more importantly, connected to you by sending your son to take all of my mistakes, all of my shortcomings and bear the burden of that on the cross. Right now, I receive that forgiveness. I receive that price that was paid. And God, I step into what you want for my life. I surrender all of my plans and take on yours and the love that you have for me. 
I give you my heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you made that decision, that is the first step of an incredible future. That is the first step of a plan and a purpose for your life. And I encourage you, don't keep that to yourself. Make sure you share that with us because we want to walk that journey with you. We want to encourage you and we want to resource you with the things that you need in order to continue to grow as a believer. So let us know, share it with us so that we can better support you in this journey. Now for all of us, let's remind ourselves of the price that Jesus paid through the simple act of communion. If you have something like bread or if you have juice, whatever it is that you were able to pull and find around you, I'd encourage you now as we jump into and listen and sing this next song, that sometime during that, you would remember the body of Christ that was broken for you. You would remember the blood that was shed. And in that remembrance, I pray that you would find clarity of purpose and identity and that you would be encouraged to step into the very future with that confidence. Because I believe this with all my heart, God is up to something great and he's invited you and me to be a part of it. So let's go.
So we talk about here at Pure Heart what our motivations are for doing things. And we have very, very deep uh, core values that are ways that we want to serve and care and love for our community. And if you missed over the last four weeks as we talked about and unpacked that, I don't want you to miss out on that, you to get sidetracked. I also kept the dog in the shot because it's cute. And I know some of you were just hoping that at the end of this, you'd get to see more of this adorable Labradoodle puppy. But let's go ahead and look at some of the things that Pure Heart did this last weekend and how that fits with our heart values. Good morning, Pure Heart family. My name is Tara Burnaby and I'm the principal here at Harold W. Smith Elementary School. I'm Darcy Estrada, the proud principal of Royal Palm Middle School and we are here with Love Our Schools Day. Today as a church body, we are in 11 different schools all throughout Washington Elementary and Glendale Elementary School District. And this is an opportunity for us to actually go in and be the hands and feet of Jesus throughout our community. Well, I came out today to uh, help out the church, help out the community, try to be of service to the people around, try to be of service to God. I mean, get the spray, get to uh, power wash these chairs, you know, make sure the kids get a good clean seat to sit. I get the privilege and the honor today to wash desks and pray over each one of these desks in each of these children's lives. It makes a difference because our students are able to see a clean campus and they're able to have a better education experience. We feel like uh, very appreciated because, you know, so many things uh, we need to do and having you guys here helping us, it's, it's great. Volunteers is just giving us a lot of love doing this. Thank you. We are so appreciative of all of these things that we don't normally have time to do. It's just an opportunity to serve and to love on these staff, the teachers, and give these students every opportunity possible. I love the fact that our church goes out and serves and loves local communities, local schools. Love Our Schools Day is one of my favorite days that we do every year because it's such a chance to be a testimony to our community of like, hey, we're here to love you with God's love. We're not here with an agenda. We're not here with a motivation. And I think that's, when people know that we're, we got an agenda, they can see right through that, you know? Uh, but when we love them with God's love, isn't that cool? Isn't that exciting? We just pour it out. Like a little dog, it doesn't have an agenda. It just wants to be loving, wants to be sweet. I'm so glad you guys joined us for Pure Heart Church Online. Hope you enjoyed the dog. If you got a good name for the dog, drop in the comments. We love you guys. We'll see you next week. Well, hey, thanks for joining us with Pure Heart Online, a place where we say it's okay to not be okay, but it's not okay to pretend and it's not okay to stay stuck. If you recently just began tuning in, we would love to connect with you and find out more about you. Go to pureheart.org slash connect card and fill out a connect form. You can always watch last week's message by clicking the link below.